You're listening to episode 71 of the Journey to Launch podcast, The Business of Money with Farnoosh Tarabi. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome back to another episode of the Journey to Launch podcast. I'm super, super excited to have you here with me today. I am going to be talking to someone I really look up to and admire in this space. I'm talking to Farnoosh Tarabi. Farnoosh is one of America's leading personal finance authorities. She's hooked on helping us live our richest and happiest lives. And from her early days reporting for Money Magazine to hosting primetime series on CNBC and writing monthly for O, the Oprah Magazine and Mint.com, she's become the favorite go-to money expert and friend. And she has a podcast, So Money, which I was blessed and lucky enough to be on twice She's a sought after speaker, best selling author. She's just all around amazing. And she's actually also a mom of two living in Brooklyn. And so, for many reasons, as you can see, I really, really admire the work that Farnoosh has done in the personal finance space. So, not only are we going to talk about the business of money, so how Farnoosh has grown her brand to be where it is today, her background because she has such an extensive history in this industry. And if I can aspire to do something and to model my career or have parts of my career make this impact that Farnoosh has had, that's what I want to do. And then the other side of it is because she's been reporting and talking about money for so long, what are the trends that she sees? So if you're a personal finance expert or someone who wants to be in a personal finance biz, this episode is for you. You're going to hear the ins and outs of the business from Farnoosh. But even if you're not on that realm, you're not in the money business, she's going to help us talk about the issues she's seen across the board with money and just our society and people. So I think it's going to be helpful in either way, but I'm going to warn you from now, this episode for me was a little bit selfish because like I took it as an opportunity to kind of get some one-on-one time with her. So I hope you enjoy it also. If you want any of the episode show notes, for anything that Farnish and I talk about in this episode, you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 71. Also, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts. That's that purple app on your phone. But wherever you listen to this, thank you for listening. And as always, tell a friend to tell a friend. I love when you're sharing the content with people that you love and know. So whether you're doing that on social media or through text messages or in real life, just tell someone to check out the Journey to Launch podcast. I also have an ask of you. It's really interesting. So I'm going to do more of the backstory after Farnoosh's episode. But I'm just going to say up front now, I am now a finalist for the HerMoney.com brand building contest. So this is Jean Chatsky. You actually hear us mention Jean Chatsky in the interview with Farnoosh. And it's so kind of mind blowing because I could not have planned this. This is just God working his magic because literally when I recorded this interview with Farnoosh, I had no idea that this would be a thing that I would actually be in this contest. This was before I actually knew anything really about me being a finalist. And now I have an opportunity to talk and be mentored by Jean Chatsky. So I want to give you the information on how to nominate me to win that. And you can do that by going to journeytolaunch.com slash her money. But you can wait for the end to hear more about that if you're just not sure. But if you know already that you love my stuff, you love my content, and I am one of your favorite personal finance experts, please vote for me to win this contest for her money. You can go to journeytolaunch.com slash her money and you'll see more information about how you can vote. Okay, so let's get into this amazing conversation with Farnoosh. Hey, journeyers. I'm super, super excited, excited to have this guest on the podcast, none other than the fabulous and prolific and amazing Farnoosh Tarabi. Hi, Farnoosh. Hi, Jamila. How are you? Good. And let me just tell everyone up front that this is probably going to be a really selfish episode because I'm going to be asking a lot of questions for my benefit. (laughs) 
But I do believe that in general, though, if you're someone who is in this space, so whether it's personal finance or entrepreneur or someone wanting to build a business, this episode will be for you because I'm going to be asking Farnoosh about how she's built her business to where it is today. So are you ready, Farnoosh? I am always ready. I'm always on. Yeah, well, this is like your thing because you have a podcast. You've been in this space for a while and we're going to talk a bit about your background just in case there are some people who don't know who you are, what you've been able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But in general, you have the podcast, So Money. You're a writer. You have books. You write for major publications. You're on TV or you have been on TV. You have major brand deals. I mean, I just feel like you're really showing the diversity of how much you can accomplish in a space that sometimes seems so boring, which is money. Yeah. So how did you decide on money? Because you have a background in journalism and you had your business management degree, but how did you end up being a personal finance expert? Well, there's that saying that you should follow your passion. And I definitely am passionate about what I do, but I think equally or maybe even more so than calling it my passion, I feel like this is just something that I'm really good at. And I'm not saying this to be a braggart, but I'm just saying like money found me in some ways. Like it was easy, right? Like you should do the easy thing. (laughs) And for some other people, that's like a completely different industry. I find other things super hard that other people may find super easy. Like I'm not interested in politics. I find covering that would be so hard or giving health advice because I'm the worst person to ever stick to a regimen around food and exercise. So I feel like in some ways, and this is, I think, good news is that if you're listening and you're wondering, how do I find my zone of quote unquote genius or my passion or what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Sometimes it's just what comes to you easiest. And my story goes all the way back to being a little girl, daughter of immigrants, growing up in working class, Worcester, Massachusetts. My parents were very hardworking. My father was an academic and then he worked in the industry as a physicist. My mother was mainly a provider at home, but also had stints in her career. She was working as an engineer at many times during her career. And together, my family really built this life for us, really pursued that quote unquote American dream. And we're Middle Eastern. So money just is a topic du jour at the table. Every night we talked about money in some capacity, whether it was the issues that were going on at my father's company related to the layoffs or no, we can't afford this trip or we're not going to send you to camp this summer because X, Y, Z financial issue or you need to get a job. And so I felt like I grew up with this fluency around money. It didn't scare me like I think Later on, I realized some of my friends in college and some of my colleagues had this anxiety or trepidation or insecurity around money. So I'm very grateful for that. And that's what I mean, like the money sort of came to me. It wasn't something that I asked for. It was just part of my upbringing, this ability to talk about money and this early education that I got around money. And then when I got older, I liked a lot of things, Jamila. I mean, I'm an appetizer girl. I go to a restaurant. I want to order all the foods, all the things. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to get one entree. And I feel like that's a metaphor for my life. I like to participate in many things. And so it was hard for me to narrow it down. But I also remembered that life is long. And I consider sort of life is a book, right? It has many chapters. And I was in college and not really sure what my chapter was going to be. Like, am I going to major in political science? Am I going to go to law school? Am I going to defy my parents and pursue theater? Because that's also something that I was really excited about and really wanted to do. But ultimately, I picked finance as my undergraduate degree because it was my father who said to me, pick something that will give you a return on your investment. You'll be able to graduate get a job, call it a day. And that can be your support system for then going out and pursuing the things that you're more excited about. Like your job doesn't have to be the end all. But while you're here and we're paying money for you to go to school, make the most of it. Now, I appreciate that advice. Maybe at the time I was a little stubborn about it, but I majored in finance. But you know what? You have to listen to your voices in your head and (laughs) even the weird ones. And I remember in college, doing the whole finance track and I got my first internship and realizing 
this is not my calling. And I know I get it. I got to get my return on my investment, but there has to be more that I can do with this degree that I didn't want to just go and work in a cubicle, crunching numbers, being an Excel spreadsheet monkey. I liked numbers, but not that much. And I was opened to this other way of pursuing money and finance, which was to talk about it, right? To tell the stories, to cover the industry. And my first internship was at CNBC in the sales department as a business major. That's where I was fitting. And I was there that I realized I want to be on the other side of this business. I want to be talking about the money, talking about business, talking about the stock market. And my background was going to be super relevant to that. And I graduated with a degree in finance, quickly entered into a journalism program, graduate degree in journalism, married the two degrees and started working in personal finance as a reporter pretty much after that. And along the way, still finding my own way, as we can talk about later. But like I said, your life is a book of chapters. And that gave me confidence. I knew this is not going to be the end all. Maybe I'm going to be completely wrong about this path, but that's okay. I kind of think that's what your 20s are for, (laughs) is to make mistakes and fail and fail hard and fail fast and pick yourself up and, and try again. And it wasn't like I was going to just throw it all away and go do something crazy. I was doing something meaningful and something that was respectable and paid and all of those good things. Sure, it wasn't too big of a risk, but I also, part of me was okay with this not working out too. You brought up something really poignant. You realized that there was another side to finance that you could do. Whereas when I went to school, I also majored in finance, but I didn't really even think about being on the other side of it. And this term of talking about money from the consumer perspective or the educational perspective, it was more of, oh, you work in a company and the finance field. And so I think it's actually really insightful that you knew to look out for those opportunities. And did you have someone in the media field that you looked to that kind of gave you the idea that this was a viable career? Or did you just know that it was something that you'd be good at, you can do yourself? Well, I remember the internship that I had, my first internship at CNBC. It was great because I was at this company that presented both sides of the equation, right? You could pursue business and work on the business side of the company, or you could actually be a reporter or producer on the news side of the business. And I had a mentor in my internship program, this woman named Michelle, who was this tall, beautiful woman. In my mind, she was the epitome of success, single New York woman, very kind, very good at her job, very much knew who she was and super confident. I think it came with the height. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. And we shared an office and I would tell her what was going on in my head and like, oh my God, I've had this light bulb moment. I think I want to work on the new side of things. And she was like, great. So I recommend you start emailing all the reporters at CNBC, letting them know that you're here for the summer and that you'd love to shadow them for a day or two. And most people will probably not respond, but one person probably will. And that's going to be a great opportunity for you. And you should seize that. And I was like, you can just do that. You can just email people. She's like, yeah. Now we see that as a no brainer, but as 19 year old me, who was only three years into email (laughs) because it was that time of of our century, I was like, I don't know if this is going to be okay, but I did it. And Kathleen Hayes, uh, who was a reporter who got back to me, I emailed everybody. I emailed emailed Maria Bartiromo. (laughs) I emailed Jim Cramer. I emailed everybody. Who knew later on I'd be working with Jim Cramer. But Kathleen Hayes, who was the senior economic reporter at the time at CNBC, wrote back and she was like, hey, yeah, absolutely. Would love to meet you. Come visit me anytime. You can shadow me. And I totally did. And she was so generous so kind. And I got to see not only how she kind of managed her day as a reporter at the network, but also her producer, who I learned was in graduate school for business journalism. And I was like, oh, there's a thing called business journalism and you can go to school for that. So I applied to that program and some other programs that was my awakening to the possibilities, the first step of possibilities. And then from there, just got more and more courage really to ask questions and find the people who I thought were doing 
things that I wanted to do. Maybe not 100%, but they were doing things that I've wanted aspects of in my own career. And I think that's a real great takeaway for people is that you might not find that mentor or that role model that is you 20 years from now, 100%, but maybe you find 10 people, right? And one person gives you a piece of this and a piece of that. And another person gives you inspiration to do that. And it's up to you to really patchwork that. And it's also up to you to create those inspiring moments. People aren't going to come knocking on your door and be like, hey, I have a piece of inspiration for you. (laughs) Right. It's amazing that you said that because same thing with me is where there's not one person that embodies everything that I want to accomplish. I see people doing things. I see the inspiration or them breaking barriers and being like, wow, that's a part of them maybe that I want to aspire to be like or I want to take and maybe I'll go to another person and do that. And so I think it's a great point for people listening. You might not find that one person that has everything, but it's to find those sources of inspiration that you can model to be like, okay, this is possible. Now, in terms of just like career wise and money, was it lucrative at that point where you thought I'll see myself making a lot of money doing this or was more just like, this is what I enjoy doing and I'm going to follow that first? I definitely didn't think I was going to get rich off this. (laughs) (laughs) That did not occur to me. And there were moments where I was like, I should just go back and work in finance, buckle down, make my six figures, and then get back to this journalism thing. But I was fortunate in that I had a lot of people around me who, even on the days where I thought I didn't have it, they thought I did, right? They were like, no, you got to keep with this, that this is a tough industry. Like any industry, if you are good at, if you, if sort of, there's this expression like do what you love and the money will follow. I believe that. I also feel like you have to do the work, but I was falling in love every day more and more with this path. And I felt like that was something worth sticking with. And I was pretty good at that point in listening to my instincts and all signs were pointing to stick with it. It's a long road, stick with it. And I also knew that I wasn't going to make bank working at a magazine unless I became the editor-in-chief. And I didn't really want to be the editor-in-chief of a magazine. So I was like, all right, what other ways can I build wealth for myself? And I did learn early on through working with Jean Chatsky, who I believe you've had on your show or you've been on her podcast or you know her. Not yet. Not yet, but maybe, (laughs) hopefully. (laughs) You should be on her podcast. She's a fantastic example of the possibilities, where you can actually take your career. And this was 15 years ago. So Jean was very much ahead of the trend, right, to become your own boss and to be entrepreneurial in the field of news and journalism and service journalism. And I was her editorial assistant for about a year at Money Magazine. And let me tell you, it was an incredible experience, opened my eyes to all the different ways you could exercise your talents and your skill set so that you weren't just a writer. You could be a writer and a radio host and an author of a book and a speaker and a brand partner. And nobody was teaching you this in school. Nobody was coming out to you and boldly saying, this is the way, this is the path that if you really want to make the most of this step that you've taken in the field of journalism and news, that you can be all of the things and do all the things and make all the money and make even more of an impact ultimately, which was the most attractive thing to me. So that was totally mind blowing. And the first step I took towards building my, you know, sort of like, you know, Uh, I guess, like portfolio of jobs within the world of money and news and journalism was to start freelancing outside of my nine to five. So in my early 20s, I worked at Money Magazine. And then followed by that, I worked at New York One News as a producer in the money unit, in the business unit, covering things like the stock market and the economy, the New York City economy, New York City small business. It was a lot of fun. I loved that job so much. And it was also there that I had some a little bit of downtime and I was able to um, I was able to write for some local newspapers and get my byline out there. And those clips later would help me to land a book deal, which then led to more things and more things. And so 
I don't want to bore you with all that, but basically <laughs> it started with a side hustle, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which parlayed into more hustles, which parlayed into a lot of different things going on while I had a day job, as you know, and then I got laid off from the day job, but it was okay because I had all of the things that I could parachute myself to land on my two feet. And then from there, again, start to build on the momentum that I've been building on the side hustle end. And I haven't looked back since that layoff in 2009. Actually, the other day I asked my husband, I was like, when did I get laid off? Has it been nine years or 10 years? Because you know, I'm celebrating at the 10 year mark. And he goes, I think it was the spring of 09. So soon I'll be having a party. You're invited. Yay. (laughs) Yeah, we're celebrating. What I hear from your story, and by the way, this is not boring at all. I'm telling you, this is so inspiring to hear how you built up your career. And a lot of that, it seems, is that you were collecting the little acorns, like the little nuggets Mm -hmm. along your way and increasing your resume. And maybe those things didn't pay right away. You know, you were probably doing a lot of things for free and contributing, but it was able to, it it built up your portfolio and your experience, which allowed you then when there was an opportunity or well, we'll call it opportunity. When you were laid off, it was an opportunity for you now to to capitalize on everything that you learned and built to that point. Yeah, I think not knowing what I was doing at the time, I look back now and I'm like, oh, I was brand building, basically. <laughs> this is before Twitter, before social media, really. I think we had Facebook, but it wasn't really the era of influencers. It was more just content people. And I knew enough to know that The more content you produce, the more prolific you are, the more places people can find you, the more likely you become the expert or the go-to person in your field. And then later on, social media became such a huge part of that equation uh, that that was also a learning curve for me, like, okay, migrating or at least straddling now the traditional platforms, right, of print and radio and magazine and television and also creating a presence and a community online. That was hard and I'm still learning how to do that. And I will say it's not necessarily where all my joy gets sparked, but I would much rather be on TV or maybe write an article for a magazine. But I understand that it's important to be as accessible as possible if you want to make an impact and you want people to um, consume your work, basically. Now you got to be everywhere. That one piece of content needs to be syndicated everywhere for one person to read it. How many years have you been in the business, you'd say? So I incorporated in 2009, Mm -hmm. but I've been basically straddling the kind of personal brand world and then the nine to five for about well over 10 years, I'd say 10, 11 years. And then I always thought, is this the month I'm going to quit or is this the year I'm going to quit? And I was just a coward. I didn't want to lose my job and the health benefits and where am I going to print my tax returns? And you know, right. <laughs> I have to go to FedEx and pay for it and I don't have a supply closet. And, then- and looking back, like that was just such a silly reason not to do it. But then I did get laid off and get severance. So that was good. Helped you. Right. That but then. Helpful. But in the overall like money space, covering money, whether it's like for a company or for yourself, it's been 15 years or more. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, I first wrote my, I wrote my first money article in college, actually, for Money okay. Magazine as an intern. And I was 21 years old. And so it's been 17 years since I penned my first Money Magazine article. Okay. So that's fascinating to me for a couple of reasons that, one, you've been in this space for a long time. And so you've seen the trends. So there's two different ways I'm going to approach this. There are the trends within the business of money, whether that's brands or people coming up and becoming the thought leaders in the space. So now, because for me, coming into the space, it's more recent for me. It's only been a few years now. It's not like I've been doing this for, you know, 10, 15 years yet. And so... But I feel like if you look on Twitter, you look online, there's so many people in this space now, what what it seems like to me, you know, you have FinCon, you have all these resources for people who are somehow related in money, whether they're a coach or have a podcast or just like talking about money or just have a blog. And like, so what are the trends or like, what have you seen? Do you feel like, okay, wow, like there's so much more people now in this space doing this when, when it was just maybe you and a handful of people before, or, or were there a lot of other people when you were coming up really interested in this kind of space also? 
I can only go back to as far as I remember. And I know there's a whole, there was probably a whole generation before mine where there were many people that were educating others on the topic of money. Uh, Lewis Ruckhauser, I think, is that who I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, maybe I always confuse his name. Lewis Ruck, Lewis Ruckheiser. No. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lewis Ruckheiser, um, was a famous American financial journalist and, uh, many people cite him as being kind of like the grandfather of personal finance in some ways, in the sense that like he had a show and he was always talking about money on his show and it was a long running show. And then of course there's the Dave Ramsey's and the Susie Ormans and, uh, and Jean Chatsky. I, I, I think of them as sort of like the great, the grandparents, although they're still young. I mean, they're mm -hmm. just more of the established, they're like the establishment, right? right. That's sort of the establishment. And they set the standards. They inspired another generation to uh, follow in their footsteps. Susie Orman, I met her recently and she said to me, Farnoosh, carry the torch high. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, where are you going, Susie? I, you know, and I, I took that to be a huge compliment because she saw in me something maybe that she saw in herself all those years ago. So I like almost fell over and died when she said that. But um, I look to these people as my role models. And I don't think that I do. Sorry, I do think that the industry has grown like the business of 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 delivering financial advice has grown because there are just so many ways to consume now. And initially it was just books and television and print and television. Basically those are the two main ways to get information out there, conferences. And now it's the internet, which has many aspects to it, right? There are podcasts, there are blogs, there's social media, there's video, there's YouTube. So there's, like a thousand ways to get your message out there. And I do think that there are way more people talking about money. I think the recession was in some ways a catalyst for a new wave of experts and coaches and content providers on this topic because it was just a reaction to where we were as a society. People needed help around their money. I always say like, I'm the busiest in my field when the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. When a lot of people are like losing their job, I'm busier than I can manage because there's just a, such a need for financial advice more than ever. Can I just jump in there? Because from the financial expert part, after the recession, it seemed that there was a need for more guidance and information, but it also seemed like more of a crowdsourcing personal finance came about where people then started to share their stories, like their own personal stories about their finances. Because I've seen that now, you know, I read that when I was in my 20s and 30s of people that had personal finance blogs that weren't necessarily experts, they were just talking about money and what they were doing. But then they were able to finagle that into a brand or a blog that made a lot of money, which is what you see a lot nowadays. It's like you have the expert side of things. And then you kind of have the people who are just sharing about their money stories who also become really popular. Mm -hmm. Which honestly, I love that. I think that is a sign that things are working and all of the efforts of places like the media and experts and authors and advisors and all the like sort of certified people and all the establishment, all that work in trying to educate people and start a conversation. I think that those seeds are now blossoming where people, everyday people are feeling comfortable. I think we can get better, but more than ever, I think now we're comfortable talking about money, revealing our insecurities, um, that we are in this era of transparency and a need to connect and we're connecting on all sorts of things and money's one of them. And I have never seen that before to the extent that I see it today. And I think maybe part of that because, because we are supported by all these platforms that give us a forum to do that before, maybe, you know, you'd have to go over someone's house and talk to them about mm -hmm. money. Now you can just do it over Facebook or, you know, an Instagram page or whatever, and so money has the conversations around money and the education around money has become so much more accessible. And I think that's a fantastic thing. It's sort of like how I see 
the evolution of education and, and conversations around to other taboo topics like sex, right, religion, politics, those were things that maybe people talked about behind closed doors or not even at all. It was just dialogue that was reserved for the experts, like Dr. Ruth. She's going to tell you everything you know about sex, and you can just go home, take your notes, and go home. But now everyone has an opinion, and everyone's sharing, which on the one hand can create overwhelm, and then it's like, who do you listen to? Who can you trust? And right. use common sense. You should always go to the experts for the serious stuff. Check in with your doctor <laughs> before you go on that diet. But I do appreciate that the conversation has really expanded and now it's so much more inclusive. There's like that gatekeeper idea that like maybe you can only have been seen or been considered an expert or had that platform if you were in a money bang zine. Now it's like because everyone kind of is their own personal media company, that they have their own Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, they can tweet or put an article out. When I look at your career and the fact that you have literally like you studied this, you've gone through the actual training to do what you've done. And I'm one of those people who come from the other side of things where I first started out talking about my personal experience. And then it did catapult me into an area of, wow, I have a knack for this also. I love doing this. How can I turn this into a business more say so that I can help more people and help myself where it's like, this is aligned my passion and then the way I can make money. And so it's like on the other side of it, I'm like, wow, I don't have as much obviously experience as you do in this space. But because of this new age of the internet and I can become my own media company, I don't need the go ahead from a major publication, although it helps <laughs> that I can now have a platform myself without someone giving it to me. I can build it on my own. And I think that's amazing. I mean, the market is huge these days. Look, there are only so many ways to safe. There are only so many ways to get out of debt. The advice doesn't really change. What changes and what makes it exciting continues to make it exciting. What continues to make the experts relevant, people like you, is you, right? It's the person who's giving the advice. Do I connect with this person? Do I like her? Do I like him? Do I feel like this person is being honest with me? I think that more than ever makes a huge difference in who we turn to for spending our time with, frankly, because you can just Google how to make a budget. That is not what people come to you for. Sure, they get that advice, but really they're coming for your perspective, your voice, the personality, the relatedness, all of that good stuff and keep on shining. Oh, thanks. Well, see, now I'm having that moment that you probably had with Susie. <laughs> I'm having with you. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the whole nothing's really have the issues around personal finance. What people are worried about have not really changed that much. And but I did want to ask you if you did see a consistent trend, like if there's something that consistently comes up in the space where people are coming to you and worried or want advice from that you've seen over the years that have not changed. Is there one common thread or theme that mostly everyone's always just questioning or worried about? All of the things, Jamila. <laughs> There's not one thing. I mean, I think that I would say these days, and I'm sure it would have been true if I was more in tune to this 10 years ago, five years ago, I don't think that it's going to ever get easy for working moms to maintain their careers, maintain their level of impact that they want to have in their families to take care of their kids and make the money and feel like they're able to accomplish things on their own terms. So that's not exactly a strictly financial question, but I see it as a huge complexity that I think, unfortunately, in 2018, approaching 2019, it hasn't gotten any easier for mothers today as it was maybe for our mothers Things have changed and the challenges have changed, but they're still challenges and they're still tough. So I'm obsessed with this topic because I'm sure you would agree that women need to make their own money and you cannot practice financial independence with someone else's money, even if it's your husband's money or your partner's money. If you really value your independence your ability to make choices, your ability to exercise your rights as a woman, as a human. You need resources. And one of the biggest resources you need is money, your money. 
And what I'm seeing now is a lot of women arriving at motherhood, which is a beautiful thing. And I hope if you want to do that, you should be able to do that. But not being prepared about the financial costs, the emotional toll, the time that it takes to do everything and that time is limited. And my God, why didn't anyone tell me that my day is going to be now divided by five? And as a result, and then on top of that, of course, companies are not very empathetic to the needs of a family. Still, we have one of the worst paternity, maternity leaves in this world. And it's just a lot of pressure for working parents to be able to handle it all, especially moms. So all this is happening and women are leaving the workforce. Moms are leaving the workforce, not because they want to. It's not because they're opting out. It's because they've been forced out. And that's a tragedy because this is a increasing trend, surprisingly. And what are we going to be as a society if we're not having women in the workforce, mothers in the workforce, women who need the money for themselves, but companies that need their input, society that needs their input, children who need to see their mothers as fulfilled beings. And I'm sorry, some moms just don't want to be home all day. That's just not their goal. And that's what's happening. They're being interrupted along the way of trying to pursue their goals because they're not prepared because society's not supporting them. So you caught me on a good day here. because <laughs> I've been writing about this a lot and I have a lot of context for this, but it's so important. We need women to have their own money. We need women to make money. We need more women to also realize this too, because I don't think that every woman appreciates this yet, that you need your own money. Money doesn't make you happy. Mm, yes, it does. Money gives you the ability to choose to leave a bad situation. Money lets you marry for love. Money lets you your own money, right? It lets you just be yourself. And it's a lot harder when you don't have it and you face tougher situations. I don't have to go on and on about it, but I think that that's something that I, has not changed. It's only getting more complex. It's scary. And I'm really doubling down on this to help as many women and families as I can. Yeah, and that work is important because as a working mom myself now, being an entrepreneur and was in the workforce and when I was working, I had the two kids and was pregnant with my last one and juggling all the things. It's definitely not easy. And so as you talk about your longstanding career in this space, I'm wondering what your thoughts are now on the FIRE movement, the financial independent retire early movement, because it's one of those things where it's become more of a thing now, so, which is good, right? Like it's it, the, in terms of the people who want to follow this. And I, I'm one person that believes everyone should want to follow this just because even if they never reach it, it puts you in a, on a better path anyway. But what are your thoughts on the whole thing? Because what I like about you and just about in general, like the ability to choose the advice we want to take from different people is that there's the general personal finance where we're talking about budgeting and living a balanced life. And maybe there's not a specific goal on you're going to reach financial independence, but you want to become wealthy. And then there's this other sub segment of that now in this space that's like, okay, it's all about saving and investing aggressively and then opting. So having the option to work or not. And I think that kind of creates kind of like this ripple between the more mainstream personal finance people and then the people who are just like, no, you got to buckle down and do more. So what are your thoughts on this whole movement now? Well, it's got us talking, which is good. And I've had a number of people on my podcast, so many who have been through that and are aspiring to it in some cases. And I think that we might be all walking around with different definitions of it, right? So I know Susie Orman got in a lot of trouble recently for saying how she didn't believe in early retirement, you can't afford it. But then she just wrote an article for Time about clarifying her understanding of the FIRE movement. So she says that she misunderstood or was misinformed like what FIRE stands for. And she assumed it meant like retiring at 40 with a with $2 million in the bank and calling it a day. Mm -hmm. She's like, who can do that? Have you seen the price of milk? Like <laughs> it's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money for a long time of life left at, after 40. Like we're living longer people. And that went viral and people were like, Susie Orman doesn't think the fire movement's legit. Right. And now she's saying, well, no, I was misled to believe that it was about like calling it quits and not bringing any, and any income that the fire movement is actually retiring early from the job that you don't really like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people that I've interviewed on my podcast who are living it, 
they're still making an income, whether it's through rental properties that they're making an income or pursuing a passion. You know, they were working in finance for many years. They left that career. They made their millions and they're 45 now. And now they want to like, you know, make pottery or they want to live on a boat or they want to uh, teach and it's a smaller salary, but they have enough in the bank to support their lifestyle. But they're still making some money. And anyone who makes you believe that you can retire at 40 with $2 million in the bank and then pass away at 100 and in those 60 years, you, you haven't had any financial troubles, like, I don't, I don't think that's the definition, but I think that's where there's a lot of, there's a confusion and anger, right. frankly, that comes out of it. It's like, wait a minute. This is a lot. This is a false bill of goods. Like, you can't arrive at 40 with $2 million and call it a day in America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think with the fire, like, and then being with my foot in the fire community space, so like one foot, like in their understanding, kind of their perspective, it's more of like, same thing. They were mad at Susie. I can't speak for everyone. I'm just speaking from what I've seen and kind of my own perspective of it is, again, being mad that she thought that, like, how can you say two million or a million is not enough? Because some people would never even like reach that one. So like, yeah. maybe it's out of perspective for her because maybe the way she spends is it wouldn't be enough. But for maybe the person who is doubling down and being conscious about their spending and wanting the option to work or not work, that having a more simplistic life and being smart and never saying that they're not working again, but just having the option to is like what they mean. So I, I like, I mean, I'm, I'm glad she actually like clarified her point, um, but it really does seem like we're all talking about the same things. We're just calling it something different. <laughs> right. And I love working Jamila. I love to work. I was born on this planet to work and whether it was working as a babysitter when I was 12 years old or working as a hostess when I was 15 or working uh, in college, various jobs. I just like being accountable. I like helping people. I like accomplishing things. I'm accomplishment driven. If there was a label to put on me, I love to do things and then see them through and finish. And I get a lot of pride out of that. And I also like the paycheck that comes with it. I like being rewarded via money for things that require hard work and skill sets. And so I don't aspire to never working again. I'm not going to aspire to quitting my job because I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm in a lucky place. I'm fortunate. Not everyone is here. Not everyone will have the chance to say that, but I think that should be the goal rather than focusing on retiring, focus on finding an occupation that makes you happy, that fulfills you, that also pays the bills. That's the Venn diagram, right? I get a lot of fulfillment. It pays me. And it's something that I can see myself doing for a while. Uh, and then, and then I think in that way, you have reached a lot of success and you could even argue that you've retired because you're not you know, we think of retire. We think of retirement as the end of an era when you've been working for the man for all these years, the grind. You know, the nine to five, Joe versus the volcano. You've seen that movie. It's like that is still people's lives, but I don't think that's what a fair definition of retirement anymore. Because these days, it's like whatever you want to make of it. Right, right, and that's the thing. It's like I've never met a person like in the movement who said I'm never ever wanna work again. It's more like they want to be able to say, I just want to work through the things I love. Okay, really great like conversation around that. And another thing I wanted to just touch upon is that I admire your ability to also pursue more than one thing at a time. And so you recently got into comedy, which I think is like, fascinating. <laughs> Can you tell? I've been so funny on this podcast. <laughs> You mentioned that you also was interested in theater. So I'm sure that theater also being interested in theater and maybe also helped you be, to be able to be on camera and to be the face and the brand. But now it's like you're translating that into another seemingly like passion of yours, which is comedy. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I guess I arrived at comedy, always admiring it, always really being fascinated by the comedians that I would see in person or on television. I come from a funny family. My parents are super funny. My brother is like the funniest person I know. We have a good sense of humor. We appreciate comedy. And I think now more than ever, we could all use a laugh track going in our lives. There's a lot of things that could otherwise make us really sad. And I 
saw an opportunity to take a, a course this summer when I didn't have a ton going on. It was like one night a week, three hours. Frankly, it kind of appealed to me to be able to leave my house with my two children, with my husband at home, and I could just leave, leave the house, and I have an excuse. And I'm, mommy's going to comedy school, everybody. <laughs> this is going to be promising. And I could just kind of fool around for three hours, but also learn and work towards something. The course was six weeks. At the end of the six weeks, you perform at a real comedy club in front of an audience. And again, Farnoosh, achievement-oriented, accomplishment-oriented, that really was what I needed to get to the finish line and feel good about it. But I think what I also learned is that it wasn't just this siloed experience that this is something that I can take with me to so many aspects of my career. When I'm presenting, it gives me more comfort on the stage. It gives me the ability to trust my instincts. If I wanted to test the audience, tell them a joke, warm them up, I feel like I could do that more now than I probably had the confidence to before. But also, it has the kind of comedy that I've been writing has been a reflection of my life the way I think, the way I process things. And I think that that is also something that I look forward to writing more about as it pertains to my philosophies around money and career and parenthood. I've been doing this for a long time, 15 years, not comedy, but the money thing as we've been talking about. And I think maybe the next contribution that I want to give my community is like, how did I get here? You know, that nobody is walking around this earth having the money beliefs that they do, having the financial life that they do, it didn't just happen. We grew up in a certain way. We had certain influences. And I want to share more of that as funnily as I can, but also in a meaningful way to get other people to think about their roots and how that has applied to where they are today. And I've been encouraged to keep writing. Um, Maybe it'll turn into a memoir. I don't know who's going to publish it, but (laughs) it's nice to have a distraction. But I always have to feel like my distractions are still feeding the biz. (laughs) Right. And I mean, it is. Like you said, there's so many parts of your business and your main thing. And I think for anyone listening who maybe is not enjoying their full-time job and is on the journey to financial independence and wanting to live a life, it's, this is how you do it. You don't have to wait for that moment. You pick up yeah. skills, you take classes, you, you find the time to better yourself and to pick up skills. And then while you were working all that time in your career and you did all these things, it ultimately builds you up to be in a position to take on opportunities. And when something does happen that looks like a bad thing or a layoff or something you're not expecting because maybe that class you took a year ago or something you've been working on will help you right then and there to help capitalize on that moment. Life is short, even though the days are long and I feel like you got to seize the day, but also along the way, if you're debating whether to do something because you're not sure if it's worth your time or how is this relative, but you are interested, you feel a pull, like you want to do this thing. Um, do it because if it is because you have fear or trepidation or insecurity and that's what's keeping you from doing it, do it. Because just getting over that is a lesson in and of itself. And it's a tool now in your arsenal. Like later on in life, you're going to be affronted with something that will be scary again, but you'll have gone through something fearful recently and you'll have the emotional tools, the skill set to thrive as not just survive, but actually thrive. And so I feel like in some ways, the comedy stuff for me has been sharpening my tool set to be able to take on life with more courage, with more confidence, with more humility, because people sometimes don't laugh at your jokes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) There's a silence all around the room. Uh You got to be able to like, be okay with that. And so that has also been helpful. Like I wanted to do something that would make me remind myself it's important to be humble. It's important to fall on your face sometimes. That That's a good exercise to go through once in a while. It really does wake you up again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I just feel like there are so many nuggets dropped in this interview, and I really hope it's going to be helpful. I know it's helpful to me. Like I said, this was selfishly like me being able to <laughs> talk to you about your career because I'm such a fan of you. All, that's all that matters. Okay, let's just be honest. You're but, number one. 
Right, right. But in general, though, I, I really do believe a lot of people um, will get a lot of benefit from this. So Farnoosh, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can listen to your podcast and anything you have else going on. Sure. Thank you. All right. So grab a pen. Uh, no, it's uh, basically you can learn all about me at farnoosh.tv. You can tap into the podcast from there, the So Money podcast. You can t- learn about my workshop and my podcast course. And I have a book workshop for people who want to write books and become famous <laughs> or just like build their brand. That's coming up again in the spring. And I'd love to connect with everybody on Instagram. That's been my jam lately. I like going on there and hanging out and answering your questions and hearing your thoughts. So if you would like to connect with me there, I'm at Farnoosh Tarabi on Instagram and hope to see you. Right. And I will add everything in the episode show notes so people can go check you out there. But thanks so much again, Farnoosh, for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you. And congrats on everything, Jamila. Thank you. Okay, journeyers, I really hope you enjoyed that insightful conversation with Farnoosh. But I'm really hoping that whether you're in the money business, personal finance business, or something else, right? Maybe you're working a nine to five or you're an entrepreneur, that you can take some of the things, some of her just strategies and insights into how she's grown herself to be this brand. And also I want to talk about just the power of relationships and relationship building. You guys are following me on this journey and I have been blessed a lot of times to be in a room with people like Farnoosh, who I view as just people that have paved the way. I'm very just inspired by, and I'm always amazed at how these relationships build upon each other. And so if I can encourage you to build relationships and to continue on your journey and seek out mentors or mentor others, it's really important because while the work we do in this world matters. A lot of what makes people or helps people get ahead is who they know or the way they interact with people. And I'm finding out that the more and more I'm in this space, the more and more that now I have to use my personal connections and grow my net worth of people to be able to have this brand, this impact that I want. It's about people knowing about me, about knowing Journey to Launch. So I find that connecting with people like Farnoosh is super important. And as you can see, she also mentioned that for her, Jean Chatsky was a mentor and someone she worked for and that she admired. And I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, but now I have the opportunity to possibly meet Jean Chatsky and have her mentor me on a one-on-one session. And so just to give you a little background about how that came about, at FinCon, so that's the financial blogger conference that I told you about, that I talk about in my content that changed the game for me and my company, Journey to Launch. But this past FinCon, Jean Chatsky spoke and she had a contest where if you enter this contest, you could be picked by her to not only be on her podcast, Her Money, but you can also win a brand consultation with her for an hour. And so I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. So I entered into the contest and they picked some finalists and I'm one of the finalists. I believe there are nine or 10 finalists. So I was picked as one of the finalists and now it's up to you, my community, to vote for me to be able to have this opportunity with Jean Chatsky, which I would totally, totally love. Jean Chatsky, for those of you who don't know, is CEO and co-founder of Her Money. She's the financial editor of the NBC Today Show, and she's a best-selling author of 11 books and an award-winning magazine columnist. So needless to say, Jean Chatsky is the ish, and (laughs) that's one of the reasons why I'd love to have opportunity to get to know her better and have her get to know the work that we do over here at Journey to Launch. And so I'd really appreciate if you can vote for me. So if I am someone that you are loving, you enjoying, I think having a sit down with Jean Chatsky, who was Farnoosh's mentor and someone she looks up to that now I look up to Farnoosh. So this is on another level would be amazing. I think this would allow me to bring you better content and just overall help me again, solidify Journey to Launch as the business I know it can be. So please vote for me at journeytolaunch.com slash hermoney. And I'll find out in a couple weeks about who won the contest. So stick around and stay tuned to see what happens next. So thank you in advance for voting for me. But I also just wanted to let you know, just it's interesting just how one small this world is, whether you're in another industry, just how everyone kind of knows each other, especially when you start 
climbing the ladder and you start to meet people. So connection and camaraderie and helping your fellow person out is super important in getting ahead. So just wanted to leave you with that tidbit. If you enjoyed my conversation, my chat with Farnoosh, screenshot, share it with me on social media. Remember, I am at Journey to Launch on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm looking forward to seeing your feedback. And until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. Journeyers.